that first Christmas we had with them, she, she'd been working in a toy store and she was insistent on buying him this teddy bear, which absolutely offended everyone, including me. We were just, you can't buy Manly Hall a teddy bear, are you kidding? And when he saw, <laughs> I know, right? And when he saw it, <laughs> when he saw it, he, he went, Toby! It looked exactly like a teddy bear he had as a child that he had lost. Hello, mystics, and welcome to The Occult Unveiled. My name is Ashley Ryan. In today's episode, we explore the significance of Manly Palmer Hall, a renowned philosopher, author, and prominent figure in American metaphysics. Manly P. Hall is such an important character to me. For my entire life, I have been in the pursuit of truth. I have searched for it in literature and philosophy. But it wasn't until I discovered the writings of Manly P. Hall that I found what I was looking for. Manly P. Hall's ability to bridge the gap between ancient wisdom and contemporary understanding is unparalleled. His vast knowledge and eloquent delivery have opened the door to generations of seekers and spiritual enthusiasts. And today, I am proud to introduce to you Manly P. Hall's understudy, Ronnie Pontiac, an author and seeker in his own right. Welcome, Ronnie. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. So you've had an amazing spiritual journey. Like when I, I was reading from uh, your wife's book, Tamara, The Making Ordinary Extraordinary, you uh, lived a pretty misfit life in Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah. I always feel busted when people show that book. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, not I didn't at all. Mean that, to... you, in fact, I'm I'm impressed that you you checked it out. And yes, I did. I had I had a very shadowy youth. But that's what's amazing is that you you were brought into enlightenment, and that's what I I love about your story, is that you were someone who felt. Um, nihilistic and angry at the world. And then you discovered the beauty of esotericism. That's an amazing, giant leap. It was. Really, two events changed my life. Uh, but to set up context for you, I was someone who was born into a family of untreated war survivors who were just drowning mm. in post traumatic stress. I was a runt and an only child. Got beat up all the time at school because I had a slight accent because my parents were afraid mm -hmm. to let me socialize with my own Ameri fellow Americans, all of whom they looked down upon. And so by the time I, I got into adolescence and I discovered music, I felt that I had no social contract. And so I wanted to mm -hmm. spoil every party and share my nihilism. Nihilism is a philosophical perspective that rejects the existence of inherent meaning in life and the universe. And hopefully raise up a, a sort of army of the disaffected. And I was pretty successful at 17, at least locally. I, I had a very popular nihilist band with a lot of bikers that were into it. And, a lot of violence around the band. That was the worst part. And very, very fortunate that no one got seriously hurt because there was a lot of reasons for people to get seriously hurt going on. First thing that happened to me was I was at a club one night and Tamara, who wrote the book, uh, she approached me terrified because she was in a dangerous situation. And even though she'd been warned by the guy who ran the club to stay away from me, she felt that I was the right person to approach, which is bizarre. And it was the first time that it ever happened to me. Mm. And something inside me responded chivalrously to this turn of circumstances, and I protected her. We wound up falling in love, and ultimately we shared this adventure together. That was the first thing, because she was a very honest, and still is a super honest, ethical, and, and so she saw what I was doing, and she was puzzled, mm. to say the least. Uh, she kept saying things to me like, like, you lie so much, but how do you remember all those lies? Isn't it exhausting or really well, great yeah. insights? So it kind of brought me down to earth and it made me not want to be in the center of violence anymore because I didn't want anything bad to happen to her. And so 
Mm-hmm. She was key to this this transformation. We were both into books, and she loved it when I read to her. And so I was trying to find a book that I'd seen as a kid, which was called Atlantis, the Mother of Empires, I believe. And it was a big, oversized okay. book. And I I don't know why, but of all the books in a metaphysical bookstore when I was a little kid and wandered into one, that one, really, I wanted to steal it. I, but it was too big to steal, especially for a kid. And so... I went to the Bodhi Tree bookstore with Tamara years later looking for that book. The irony of the situation is that book was written by Stacy Judd, who was the architect of PRS. Okay. The Philosophical Research Society, my favorite place on earth. We spend a lot of time there, don't we, Ashley? Pythian, you're not really doing your job with personal anecdotes. Fine, let's let our guests continue talking about it then. So in a weird way, I was reaching oh. out to PRS in that book. And so what I found instead of the Atlantis book was a Manly Hall book called The Secret Teachings of All Ages, except this was the encyclopedic Like the big outline. oversized one? Not the big one. There was, there was the sixth edition, which was like, like smaller, but was still a tome. And the pictures were black and white. It's okay. really, I love this. It's, it's an amazing little book, but not as grand as the one you're talking about. But it still seemed to me that it was something from the 19th century. It seemed very old. The picture of the author was this barrymore looking guy who always already looked kind of up there in the picture. And I just assumed it was somebody that had died a long time ago. At the time, I was consumed with fears of earthquake caused by a family that I knew who were moving. Hello, Kitty. A family that uh, was moving to... Uh, Virginia Beach, because they'd been affected by Edgar Casey's warnings about California potentially dropping into the ocean. Whew. Edgar Casey. Edgar Casey was an American mystic who provided thousands of psychic readings to his clients on health, spirituality, and future events. So I was filled mm-hmm. with this kind of fear of it. And I was talking to her one day and I mentioned this book and how it blew my mind. And she said, oh, honey, you, you should go to Los Feliz and hear him talk some Sunday morning. <sighs> what? Wow. He's alive? Know that, that, yeah, that he's alive. Yeah, like- exactly. And oh. she was like, yeah, it costs a dollar, 11 a.m. And then she told us these stories wow. about him that were hilarious. And she was a carny dancer at one point. And she was telling us that when he was young, like all the women were after him and how they were all scheming as to how to yeah. get to him and stuff. And I was afraid to go there because I, I knew who I'd been. And I just thought they would look, everybody there would look right through me and go, no, no, we don't want this scumbag around here. So I stalled and I stalled. And mm-hmm. then finally Tamara said, he's going to, he, you know, he's an old man. And how will you feel if you never mm-hmm. hear him? I mean, don't you want to go yeah. see this guy that changed your life? Because his book, blew my mind. It didn't get at the fear I was feeling, but it took me from somebody mm-hmm. who believed that there was no meaning in life and that life was really just a cruel joke on us all. And mm. it turned me into somebody yeah. that believed that there was a, a rational soul at the center of life, at the center of the world and of nature, and that you could interact with this, with nature, and that life would show you beautiful things and, and bring you to where you need to be. And so I had to see this man who had moved my mind around that way and had really moved me in terms of seeing these people that he 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 took their work and made it available to us. But these people had risked death to explore these realms yeah. and then to share them with us, to write them down, even if symbolically, or to make art out of them that conveyed these messages. And I was deeply moved by that. And I also found so much wisdom in it. And it also seemed to be lurking behind so many great things, so much, so much great art and literature. Oh, I was just going to say, I had a really similar experience. I was in a really, really low place when I discovered Manly. I had been engaged to a not wonderful person Mm. and I found the strength to leave the relationship. And like on Google Maps, when I moved to LA, I like took note of all of the cool places I wanted to go and like explore. And my my major, my undergrad major is in philosophy. And I was like, the Philosophical Research Society, that sounds super cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I started volunteering there after the breakup. And I 
I learned who Manly was and it was he's like a modern sage. Mm-hmm like getting to see the wisdom that he he made so digestible his work is so easy to read and i was like wow this that gave me hope that like i'm not this useless woman who who has no value but to be able to to see the the truth of the world and like looking behind the veil Mm -hmm. really opened up my heart like it did yours Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, So many people have uh, had that experience when I worked for him. And then even later, it was weird how often we would run into people that actually liked Manly Hall's work, but wouldn't admit it in the world of punk rock. And I wasn't telling people. (laughs) Yeah. And Tamara wasn't telling people that we were into it. Like we were very quiet about the metaphysical side of our lives. And yet we attracted people who would start confessing to us their interests in these matters. And how often his name came up was really glorious. And often in that moment, as as the person who really lit the candle for people when they discovered esotericism and gave them hope about life. So I'm delighted to hear that you had that experience too. I think that's wonderful. Yes, thank you. And uh, as you were saying, so both you and Tamara went to a lecture. Do you remember the name of the lecture I by any I, chance? I did, but I don't. But it, a part of the reason was that he... He delivered directly to us messages, and he had done this a lot, I found out later when I worked for him. In my case, he looked straight at me during the lecture and he said, people who have irrational terror of natural disasters like earthquakes, because they have so much guilt about how they've been living their lives. Mm. Tamara, yeah, right? It was pretty amazing. Uh, it blew my mind completely. I was convinced there and then that I had to work for him in any way that I could. He also looked at Tamara, who yeah. had been, uh, as she was walking to the lecture, she noticed this very small little weed that had bloomed between cracks in the sidewalk. And it really struck her. And she mm-hmm. she was appreciating the beauty of it, and but also its frailty. And he looked right at her and he said, Uh, People who have lived lives with very difficult beginnings, but like a little flower that finds its way through a crack in the concrete, they find a way to bloom and bring something Mm. beautiful into the world. So we both discussed this as after after we left, right? We were like, what just happened? And how did he do that? And what? Now, later I found out that he couldn't see us. His vision at that time was very poor. So he had some sense, and there was a lot of discussion at PRS about what exactly that was. Was he channeling? Was he somebody who was an initiate and therefore had this telepathic power to read into our souls? Was he, my personal Mm. metaphor for it, because they're all metaphors, is that he was so deeply in the Tao at that point. Tao. In the ancient Chinese religion of Taoism, the Tao represents the underlying harmony that governs the natural world. He was really into into Eastern paths. He wanted to actually do his secret teachings based around that. And he cool. his office was filled with Chinese and Tibetan and Japanese art. And I felt like he was moving in the flow of nature, of, of things, of the Tao, of being. And as Plotinus says, we all breathe together. And that's why astrology works, because we're all going through these changes together. And I think that he trusted this process and it gave him these flurries of synchronicities because being around him was just mm. a constant parade of synchronicities. I I totally know what you mean by the feeling of, of being connected to the Tao. Actually, it's kind of a silly joke. That was my internet name for years so when it would pop up on my phone it says you are connected to the Tao. Oh, that's great <laughs> um, a nice reminder so you want to talk about the yes of course the office um you know going into manly's office i've been honored to be able to to go in there i'm sure it's changed since you've been there but the big desk is there and you see the ornate there's a still an altar and, and the it's like going out of the regular world into this beautiful serenity Mm -hmm. i only saw the office once after he left when he was in there it had the most amazing vibe it it was so serene so tranquil so filled with 
with knowledge and the love of knowledge and all the good things that had happened in there in all the many years that he had been counseling people and discovering things he was eager to share with all of us and would write them down. And yeah. I loved being in there. Tamara writes about in her book that she would often stand in his office and ask him questions about what's this and what's that. And so many little details on the altar and on the shelves. And it was always yeah. fun to hear his explanations. Yeah. And so they brought in somebody who was the producer who ran Live Aid and who was a big fan of Manly Hall's work. Yeah. And he thought that he could bring PRS into the modern world and take it online and make these archives mm -hmm. available to everyone. But what he ran into was a lot of cliques yeah. and people who are trying to take over the future of PRS. He actually mm -hmm. said to this friend of mine, Arthur Johnson, an incredible jazz guitarist who was the driver and sound man for Manley Hall. He told him that there was a really difficult challenge in dealing with arms dealers, but he had done it. He said that rock band managers were worse, he discovered when he did Live Aid. But he said that the old ladies of PRS were the worst that he'd ever encountered, the most unreasonable people. <laughs> and so they called me in because I had been considered the heir apparent by some people. and. Some people were saying you need to bring him back. He can give the lectures. He's he's the one that that Manley Hall was was training in a sense. I really he had been right, very yeah, explicit with me. Don't do that. So I did go though because oh. I wanted to meet the guy and I, I wanted to find out if there's anything I could do in the background to help this chaos settle down a little bit. And when I walked in the office, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. although it still had some of that in it it just was so different. It was, it was so much reduced from how it had felt when he was in it. So he, yeah, his I'm own sure. presence had this, I think, that, you know, it really is Baraka, if you want to use the, the Islamic term, holy people have this presence about them. And, and in India, they teach mm -hmm. that just being in the presence of a teacher with that kind of presence can enlighten you. And I certainly felt that way. I being around yeah. him, uh, just sitting near him and listening to him talk. And it was just so again tranquil and and you just felt that all was right with the world i once heard somebody say at prs that there would never be a severe earthquake in in los angeles as long as he was walking around in it and that might have been an exaggeration mm. but you felt like that you felt like his presence was so connected and so peaceful that just existing yeah i i can imagine yeah existing in our community he was like this blessing on everyone even if you didn't know he was there, there was like mm -hmm. this feeling, this vibe that was radiating from, from his life. I, I've only been able to listen to the recordings and I, I, the best way I can describe it is when I listen to it, I feel like I'm being wrapped up in like a hug Yeah, and I feel very safe. So I, yeah, I know what you yeah. mean. So what exactly uh, for our, our listeners, what did you do for Manly? You were kind of his protege. You were kind of also like a grandchild, like what, it, like not birth grandchild but like he treated you with like such love and admiration it was like um like that kind of relationship the strange thing is that he saw in me something that i didn't see when i when i went to prs2 mm. uh and tamara went with me to volunteer i was really envisioning cleaning toilets i mean i knew i had no skills and i was willing to do anything just to be around the place and to soak in this this incredible yeah. community when we met with uh, the person who would interview volunteers, they were thrilled by Tamara because she had office skills. By me, not at all, mm -hmm. because I had nothing. But I did mention that I grew up in a family that spoke a lot of languages, European languages, and that sparked interest, which was strange. But I got a phone call the next day saying, Manly Hall wants to meet you. Wow. Yeah, so I, cool. I couldn't believe it. And super exciting, and yet, intimidating. So I couldn't imagine why, but I, I was shown into his office, went through that, that door and he had these two older women on one side and two on the other, the women who ran the place. They were like this phalanx of mm -hmm. guardians. And then he was sitting there behind yeah. his desk with a smile on his face. And he came in and when I came in, he said to me in a WC Fields accent, come on in and make yourself miserable. And so <laughs> I, I sat down in the chair 
he had a pile of paper in front of him and he slid it in front of me. And this was the bibliography of his alchemical collection. And he said, I understand you have some familiarity okay. with European languages. And I said, yeah, I grew up around them, but I don't read them or speak them, really. I mean, I kind of understand them. He said, that's fine. That's a good start. He said, I want you to edit this for me. So I told him, I, I just wow. started reading about alchemy in your book. Alchemy. I can't say too much on this subject, except that alchemy turns lead into gold. So mysterious, Pythian. So mysterious. All right, back to the show. I don't know what a bibliography is, and I don't have any of the skills that you apparently think I have, but I'm super honored that you would consider mm -hmm. me, but I, I'm so sorry. He said, young man, I, I, I know you can do it. And he said, why don't you take this with you and you can look it over, familiarize yourself with it a little, and then come back and talk to me about it. So I picked it up and I mm -hmm. walked out of the library and I thought, this is, this has got to be wrong. And sure enough, the vice president of the society, who'd been a former military officer, she came running around the corner and she, she grabbed the paperwork from me and said, that was a mistake. And I said, thank you. I, I think Rude. it was. <laughs> yeah. Well, she was, she was kind of wonderful. She wow. was very defensive of him. And I think she was thinking, oh okay. no, he's, he's letting some, some scumbag in here <laughs> giving him the alchemical bibliography. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. I felt good about it. I got to meet him. He was so delightful and, and that was good enough. And I went back and told Tamara all about it and thought that was the end of it. But got a call that afternoon mm -hmm. and it was his secretary saying you and manley hall in his office tomorrow morning 9 a.m okay. okay so i come back and it's just him and he says from now on if anybody contradicts anything i tell you you come tell me you take orders only from me he said i have faith in you being able to do this I will help you in the morning. I will go over mm. what you need to do that day. Then in the evening, before we call it a day, I'll see what you've done. We can have lunch in the vault and you can ask me questions about any of the books that are in the bibliography or anything else that you want. And you can look over the books that you're working on whenever you need access. Wow. That's incredible. It was incredible. And, and it was especially amazing that he did it because I was a thief and, and I was mm -hmm. immediately lusting after things that I saw and just wanting them. And mm -hmm. he would meet with me and we would, you know, after a few weeks passed, he invited me to come over for dinner and to meet his wife. So I brought Tamara with me. And then he talked to me about that, about being a thief and a friendship between a thief and a priest. It really got to me. And he also said at the same, yeah. in the same meeting, he said at the end of that evening, as we were leaving, and you're welcome to take any of the books that you want to take home, home and keep them no. as long as you would like. It, it actually incredible. took me a while to, to use the, that invitation, especially for the books that I had, I had been feeling thievery about, but it, it stopped mm -hmm. me. I never, ever, ever after that had any desire to steal anything. And, uh, I felt wow. such loyalty to him and, and that he, he was giving me this opportunity. It seemed to me at the time that he knew what he was dealing with. And so he was giving me that I opportunity so anyway, that, that was a life changer for me. So it I became like his it. research assistant. He would send me off mm -hmm. to get books that he needed or, or to go to book shops to pick up something rare that, that he needed for something he was working on. PRS would buy it and I would pick it up. He got me to be eventually his screener. And actually Tamara mm -hmm. wound up being the screener that he trusted even more. And he would send both of us. He would always say, take mm -hmm. her with you. <laughs> and what she said every time except once was always what he went with. 
Whereas with me, I was a little over optimistic, I guess. And, and sometimes he didn't agree with my opinions about who should meet him. But it was a great education seeing who wanted to meet him and how he was this kind of last resort for people who had crashed yeah. in spiritualism or ceremonial magic Burned. or many yeah. other areas. And, and then I also became his designated uh, substitute lecturer because he, I think he was in cahoots with a, the, the main librarian, Pearl, who booked all the lectures. And she suddenly approached me and said, you know, you need to be lecturing. I, again, I've never given a lecture. Mm. I, I don't really think I should be lecturing. I'm just assisting him. And that's, that's good enough. But I did talk to him about it. And he said, yeah, I agree. I think you should be. And, and do it the way I do it. Don't use notes. Because if you don't know what you're yep. talking about, you shouldn't talk about it. And so they booked me for a Sunday morning when he couldn't lecture. <laughs> well, they never mm -hmm. booked anybody except like the really established speakers, his, his former wow. substitutes and still occasional substitutes like Dr. Stephen Heller. And um, they, they were the ones that got that peach gig. I didn't. I was supposed to start on Tuesdays or Mondays up in the little lecture room above the library, but they just pushed me right Surprise. on the main stage on Sunday. <laughs> I'd seen him give so many lectures and I've been working with him so closely that I just, I basically did my own kind of imitation of his style of what he, what he did and people loved it. So suddenly I was a popular lecturer at PRS and he decided Amazing. that I was the one that would substitute if available whenever he was too ill. So that, basically, mm, that was okay. that side, the work side. On the other side, a lot of it, thanks to Tamara, I think, is that first Christmas we had with them, she, she'd been working in a toy store and she was insistent on buying him this teddy bear, which absolutely offended everyone, including me. We were just, you can't buy Manly Hall a teddy bear? Are you kidding? And when he saw <laughs> I know, right? And when he saw it, <laughs> when he saw it, he, he went, Toby, it looked exactly like a teddy bear he had as a child that he had lost. And after that, he and Tamara wow. were just buds. <laughs> they were they were total pals. And of course, Marie loved Tamara. Oh my god! And would always advise her, mm -hmm. uh, always telling. Her, for instance, she she said when I became a lecturer, now you be careful. Don't let him go down the path that Manley did. She said that that egotistical metaphysical mm -hmm. teacher path. She said, it's that masculine, oh. you know, thing. They've got to be worshipped by everyone. <laughs> Stuff like that. She was like a riot girl before we'd ever heard of riot girl. Riot girl. This movement was a disruptor, not only to the world of punk rock, but also to the world of women empowerment. Ashley, if we had been born a little earlier, we would have rocked it. You're damn right, Pythian. I was reading that in the book and I'm like, Marie was a spicy lady and she had that German accent. Yes. And so like, I totally resonate with that energy. And I, I was always surprised. I was like, oh, wow, she calls Manly out on his ego, but yeah. I guess only a wife could do something like that. Oh, it was so funny to see because everybody loved him and he was constantly adored. Mm -hmm. And she'd say things like, like when that was mm -hmm. happening, she turned to us and said, look at him. He loves it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yeah but they loved each other you know, they were I, they were I, an amazing couple i mean people did. call her crazy and I, there's reasons why they would i mean she was super worked up she, she was really she was stuff, suffering from diabetes and didn't know it and she was having sugar spikes mm -hmm. and she'd get way worked up about stuff and and just wow giving speeches but what speeches based on her studies and on her theories about ontology and uh, the nature of spirituality brilliant stuff and so it was it was a kind of wonderful even though it was scary sometimes because she'd get so emotional and angry about the nature what's going on in the world yeah. but they were very deeply in love i feel that um i i that's the thing that's most of the people who call her crazy think that they weren't really that good friends. They, they've even called her a beard, you know, suggesting that he was gay and that, that she just married him. I've heard that. Yeah. yeah. And I never saw anything like that. I saw them be so sweet to each other and so sweet on each other that it changed my whole concept of what a relationship could be when you're when you're older. Because everybody I knew who were in mm -hmm. relationships and were old had had pretty bad relationships. And 
And here were these two people who were in love, like a couple of teenagers. I mean, every time we were around them, Aww. something would happen where she'd, she'd come up to him and start playing with his curls. And it was really cute. And he, he just started purring like a it's cat. Precious. You know? And yeah, and they, they really Aww. understood each other. They took us out to the museum, for example, and then they would talk about everything. And we just kind of walked behind them going, wow, listen, listen to this conversation. Listen to what they know. Like truly sages of like the the modern era that's incredible mm -hmm. i love to hear yeah. like he's got this jovial side manly p hall likes jokes yeah. he's like enjoys laughing he's not so serious maybe yeah. as we like to to think when we read his work um in the book it said that he had cartoons and and like, comic books next to his bed is that true yeah that that was his favorite bedtime reading sometimes he'd also look at his stamp collection he got oh. he got a big kick out of that but he loved having cartoons and hmm. joke books and he loved telling jokes. He taught very often through jokes. When he told you a joke, it, you really needed oh, yeah. to pay attention because he would, he, there'd be something in there for you. And, and he loved, he just loved being convivial mm -hmm. when you were around him. He wasn't this heavy presence. He wasn't somebody who was saying portentous things. He was sweet and humorous and he'd, he'd do, like I mean, Marie would take over really because she was, you know, we were all there for as far as she was concerned to listen to her and her, her great revelation. And so she would stand up all four foot 11 of her and start pacing around the living room <laughs> with her German accent and, and start talking about the space mother principle and, and she'd get like tears in her eyes saying how the space, space mother is so full of love that she lets the gods who create the, the universe believe that they are the real creators and just surrender space to them. And wow. yeah, it was beautiful. But he would look at, at Tamara and like make these weird faces and stuff, like in reaction to stuff Marie said, he'd lift an eyebrow suddenly, but mm -hmm. these quiet little things that would make her laugh. And then Marie would like look over mm -hmm. like, what are you mm -hmm. laughing about? And then she'd turn around and go, Papa, stop that. <laughs> and i love that yeah it was really cute and and so they were oh great to God. hang with so that was like a family kind of thing we had not had yeah. grandparents in our lives and really very good family lives at all either one of us and and so th being around them was like having the best grandparents ever and he would answer my questions yeah it really sounds like it yeah he'd answer my questions about things i was studying he was very gracious about it. But the second that was over, he did not want to, he'd say, I don't like talking about work at home. And so he would talk about respect that. the Dodgers and how they were doing this year and which pitcher he the liked. Dodgers. And he would talk about uh, some Ooh. something that had happened to him in the past that, that really wasn't metaphysical. It was just some interesting experience that he had had. He would talk about his stamps and this incredible Does stamp that, that he had life? found. And uh, yeah, it was great. I mean, they... They took us out to so many dinners at his favorite restaurant and we got to ask them questions and what? it was a, a, an absolutely Does that restaurant still exist I, I don't know if it's there or not it was called michael's it's on las Feliz, just down the street from prs and on sundays he oh, ruled that a... place because everybody who went to the lecture would know that he was there they go to michael's and it was such an honor to sit mm -hmm. at his table and watch and listen, as all these people walked oh. up to him and said things like, you know, we came all the way from Ohio to see you and we just wanted to thank you so much for, for wow. how your books have changed our lives. Or somebody else who came up and said, I don't know if you remember me, but, but you were the one who convinced me to become a Freemason and that helped me to overcome my addictions or just mm -hmm. one thank you after another. And he would just kind of graciously sit there and then Marie would turn around and glance at us mm -hmm. with that look that said, look at him, he loves it. <laughs> Yeah, I feel that. I I love that so much. There's also a story that I, I want to share from the book that one time when you oh, had to wait for a table that he actually stopped domestic violence. Like, yeah. tell us about that. This is a great example of his the synchronicities around him. So Tamara and I were studying Apollonius of Tyana and we ran across the story that he stopped a riot just by being so dignified and, and peaceful. And we thought that was BS. No way. Yeah, totally. So I, I agree. Right. So we were going to talk to him about it at Michael's. 
Mr. Hall, this can't be true, right? I mean, what is it a metaphor? There's no way this guy stood there and stopped a riot. Mm -hmm. This was an off night and he, they were busy. So he wasn't usually, even if he came, then it wasn't Sunday, they would just take him right in, but it was, they couldn't do it that night. Mm -hmm. They asked him, can you, can you stay in line? He was very gracious. Of course, no problem. Um, so we stood with him. Marie went off to park the car and that's a whole nother story because Marie driving and parking and all that was, was truly Valkyrie esque, fearless <laughs> and dangerous to everyone around her. But, but ne always avoided accidents, amazingly. And we, we really wondered sometimes sitting in the back of the car as Tamara Rice, if they were like protective angels or something, making sure that nothing happened. I mean, she would just they had to go be. <laughs> right through red lights, you know, just, yeah, it was amazing. But she was parking. So it was just oh, Tamara, myself and, and Manly Hall. And in front of us was a couple, this man. Uh, just, I guess he was just an irate fellow and he had a very kind of nervous looking wife. And she saw that, you know, here was this big man standing there with a cane. He was quite aged. And so she tried to kind of move to give him lots of space. And this, for some reason, angered her husband. And um, he grabbed her hard by the arm mm. and he started, he got red faced and he started to, to say something to her under breath, just obviously just stop your nonsense of some kind okay. and it kept going she just looked frightened i saw manly hall yeah. move his feet he had these big feet and these big orthopedic shoes and he he kind of moved his feet very slowly like like a like tamaris was like a tai chi master so imperceptible mm -hmm. not looking at what was going on looking way beyond it and he yeah. maneuvered between them she she saw what he was doing and she suddenly ducked behind him. Well, this guy okay. was furious. Uh, he got up on his haunches and, and looked up at Manly Hall and, and started to yell at him and was like spitting. He was so angry. Ooh. Face turned bright red. I had turned sideways. I was like, this is going to be a fight. I'm going to have to get in here. And mm -hmm. um, well, Manly Hall just kept staring. And it looked like he was looking at some beautiful Zen garden or something. He was so peaceful. So just like it wasn't happening. And we saw this guy. So he was looking at the person. No, right past like him. Like at the person. Like over No, he's him. just looking from. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, you over know, him. way okay. over and, you know, over there somewhere. And never mm -hmm. acknowledged him in any way. And wow. we watched okay. this guy okay. kind of cave in. He, 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 he became wow. ashamed like, can I... and then he, he slumped huh. and he turned and looked at his wife. He took her hand. He apologized to her. He apologized to Manly Hall and to the line. And then he walked away with her. Unbelievable. That's, That's right? incredible. And so we did not ask about Apollonius that night because we saw a demonstration in, in miniature. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Like just hearing that you're, you, and you talk about like the aura of the person, like that's, that's very special. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He was so, so revered oh. everywhere we went. That was the other thing. It was it, to, to go to a bookstore with him was, was a hell of an experience. In LA, sure everybody was, knew yeah. who it was. And it was just, it was so, uh, it was like being with a rock star, except it was better because he was this man who had spent 50, 60 years in public service and in LA affecting people's lives. Mm -hmm. It was really a, a fantastic uh, community that he had built up of people who were caring. And uh, I mean, they took us in and the gifts of astrology books and other things that I received, for example, all the CC Zane stuff, you know, the, the church of light, um, yep. all the just really unbelievable gifts, including a gift from him of the, the big giant edition that we were originally talking about of the encyclopedic yeah. outline oh. and his own copy of Waits brotherhood of the Rosie cross. So generous. I cannot wait until I have a big enough, apartment or house to have like in the foyer when you walk in and the, the big book is sitting there like on a beautiful yeah. like wooden arch and you can oh that's that's the dream and I'm so 
happy for you. Like your journey, Ronnie, like to show how you, you really, you came from the darkness into the light and, and the blessings that you received. Um, they're inspiring. Well, thank you. I feel very humbled. Um, I, I, I still feel a sense of wonder that I got to have that experience and that he, he blessed us with that care and love and, and even, uh, even took so much interest in us that when he got hold of our charts, he and Marie decided that we should get married. And they, yeah, and they chose three dates (laughs) and said, you pick it. That's one of these three. And we had no intention of ever getting married. We thought that was the death of a good relationship. And, but then he said, well, I'll officiate in my backyard. Oh, okay. (laughs) Right. And that's incredible. Yes. Yeah. And he had (laughs) these two trees that were growing, beautiful trees that were growing together out of a single trunk. And, and right there in front of that is where he officiated. Incredible. I mean, just mm-hmm. so many experiences that, that were um, life-changing and life-affirming. And, and uh, just, I still am in awe of the whole experience. Do you have a favorite memory? One of my favorites is when I was about to give my first lecture. And okay. I went over there the day before just to get a pep talk because I was mighty nervous and he thought that was amusing (laughs) and he he gave me a pep talk. And then I mentioned that I didn't have a decent tie and could I borrow one possibly from him? And he came out with this small collection of these beautiful, really, I mean, incredibly detailed Chinese ties like gold mm. in them and I mean, just they were just beautiful and he gave them to me and I said why well, I've never had a chance to wear these you take them and you can wear them when you lecture and and then I said well one thing also I don't know how to tie a tie <laughs> so Manly Hall oh ta- and you didn't have YouTube to no look it up YouTube back then <laughs> exactly so Manly Hall taught me how to tie a Windsor knot <laughs> and it was such Aww. a sweet moment it was so grandfatherly and just, yeah, yeah. I love that, that yeah. moment. I thought it was something very special to me. Yeah. I, I think that's very sweet. And I, I love hearing these stories because it really humanizes a legacy. Mm-hmm. You know, we think of Manly as this like kind of far off figure, but he was human just like us. And, you know, do you, do you go to PRS anymore? Do you go to the philosophical research society? I have, I've, only been there twice i do what i can to Mm -hmm. to help them out Mm -hmm. and maybe i will i'll pop up there sometime to do a lecture we've talked about it there's various reasons Mm -hmm. uh it's it is difficult it it feels a bit like a tomb i mean but prs is doing great and it's a wonderful vibrant community but he's not there and the other people and you aren't there oh yes yes your book right here the american metaphysical religion Mm -hmm. Yes, this is I have started reading it. I very much enjoy it. And I can see Manley's influences in your writing. Yes, very much. It's a it's almost a I mean, it it came from the started at PRS in that vault during one of those lunches. I found Mm -hmm. a volume that he told me, yeah, you should check that out. It was a big leather tome, opened it up and it was called it was a newspaper called The Platonist. And yeah, published hmm. in the 1880s in St. Louis, which was a cow town then. It was still the Wild West, basically. It was the year of the OK Corral. So I asked Manley Hall about it, and he didn't know much about it either. There, was, there wasn't very much information about it. It started me on the process that wound up being the book for years, just for fun. Very cool. When Tamara and I would tour, for example, with our band, we'd go to libraries and we'd go to bookshops looking for rarities and looking for anything that would shed light on these questions, because that Platonist question led to questions about the Theosophical Society, about the Hermetic Brotherhood mm-hmm. of Luxor, and all kinds of other stuff, even the Transcendentalists. So we did find some books. And then eventually, and it, really it started in the 80s a little, but 
but really in the 2000s, there was this massive explosion of, of academia having interest in the esoteric. It was suddenly okay to do that. And so archives yep. were opened and articles and books were written about things that had not been available to Manley Hall. And it changed some wow. of the things that he had written about. It changed how we look at some of the people and mm. some of the events. And so I would often have the feeling of what I wouldn't give to be able to, to walk into his office and say, look at this. Because it had something that I he'd did. been working on and that he, he really wanted to know. So that book is filled with those moments, with the things I wished I could have shared with him. So in a sense, it's a continuation of his work. I'm focusing on America specifically, yeah. although, of course, the whole world is represented in America. But it is certainly yes. inspired by him and, and made possible by him. You know, you are doing such an amazing job of keeping his legacy going. I know that was one of his fears as he was growing older, that he would be largely forgotten in his work, dis, you know, discarded. But it's not people like you, people like me, everyone who goes to the Philosophical Research Society and supports them, gives Manly that legacy and lets it keep going. And I... I do recommend for everyone to check out Manley's work. You can find it at PRS.org. Check out Ronnie's book, The American Metaphysical Religion, and study for yourself because Manley has something for everyone. That was the beauty of him. He never really had any particular thing that he was trying to sell to you. He wanted you to have right. a thirst for knowledge and find your own delights. And I love that about him. He, he never had an agenda. It was simply, look at this amazing knowledge that I found. And working with him, I saw that every day because here's a man in his 80s who was writing journal articles, multiple journal articles, preparing for his weekly lecture, writing several books at once, and all of it based mm -hmm. on these, these discoveries and, and his joy in sharing that knowledge with people. His memory was incredible at that time in his life. He would send me up into the library and tell me exactly what shelf a book would be found on and what the cover looked like. And so cool. he changed my whole concept of, of, I guess when you get old, you, you lose your mind. He may not have been quite the writer that he had been when younger, but he was still turning out eloquent, useful, brilliant writing right up till the end. His last lecture is beautiful and inspiring. Mm. Ronnie, thank you so much for opening up and sharing these experiences with me and all of our listeners today. Oh, thank you so much for having me on here. And thank you for all the great work that you do. You're a wonderful scholar. It's really great to see you, you doing your work out there. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Can you tell our listeners where they can find you online? I usually just say, um, use your favorite search engine and search Ronnie Pontiac and you'll find books, films, music, and, and none of it really fitting together and in, in the way you might expect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's great to have a diverse, a diverse work of um, portfolio. That's what I mean to say. It's funny because Google thinks I'm different people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's some other Ashley Ryan's out there. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> well, thank you again oh, so much you so for your much. presence today. Continue the beautiful work. Thank you. And until next time, mystics, stay magical. The Occult Unveiled is produced by F Street Productions and M is for Magic. Our executive producers are Ashley Ryan, Michael A. Simon, and Scott Kushner. Our show is produced by Deborah Simon. Our audio producer is Bill Schultz. Our talent booker is Perry Turcott. Laura Kaufman is our coordinator. Thank you for listening. And for more information on any of the topics you heard today, plus really cool links and ways to learn about Ashley, Pythian, and all of our guests, go to the occultunveiled.com website. The Occult Unveiled, copyright 2023.